result then, we have multitudes of psychopaths running around, claiming to be born again, taught of the Spirit, hearing from God, that preach a gospel that makes the devil smile. Some of the stuff I hear on the internet, it makes me cringe, and my heart sad. I know it's making the devil smile, that's for sure. Some of the things I hear people saying on their channels, it's horrible. Just like I said, sins that I shudder to even mention committed daily by these professed Christians, and nobody blinks because everybody thinks it's all magically covered. No, it's these iniquities that are going to separate you from God. The wickedness of the wicked. Jeremiah said it the best in Jeremiah 6 and a couple other places. He's, were they even ashamed that they had committed these abominations? No, they were not ashamed. They didn't even know how to blush. So it is in the news today. We see the fornications and the lust and the perversions and on and on and on. The death of children, the murder, the suicides. They don't even blush that these things are being done under the preaching of this claptrap gospel that's leaving everybody in bondage to their sin. So what remains to be said? If we can say... In John, then, he who does what is right is self-righteous, and he who sins is of God, then the world's upside down. See, the person committing the vile sins is approved by God, but the person walking worthy of his kingdom, his flesh crucified, holy and pure in heart, in intentions, telling others to forsake their sins or suffer the consequences, he's Beelzebub. I gotta say, the world's upside down. So they go on in their professed Christianity. They go on getting drunk less, uh, fornicating less, uh, lusting after all manner of images and distractions less, and cheating and lying and stealing, coveting, all that stuff, honestly believing that they're being progressively sanctified by the Spirit while they're safe and secure in the arms of Jesus no matter what happens because they're just humble sinners saved by grace. See, they think that's humility to admit that you're messing up all the time. That you're just walking around with your eyes full of adultery that can't cease from sin. Just carousing in the daytime, as Peter would talk about it. Well, no. No, see, your clouds without water. You're twice dead, pulled up by the roots of which of the utter darkness of blackness of eternity awaits you. But see, no, you don't believe that. Because you don't believe that he who sins is of the devil. And he who does what is right is of God. He's righteous as Jesus. Because he's doing what Jesus said to do. And to be as perfect as God. No, we'll never be perfect in knowledge or free from ignorance in this life. But we certainly can be free from these sins of ruin and destruction and perversion. Walking uprightly in God by the power of his spirit. You claim to have that power. Where is it displayed and evident in your life? If you're doing these things all the time. You keep arguing in favor of them. I have to assume that you're doing them. But no, you in your eyes, you look at us as preaching sinless perfection, trying to be as perfect as God, and boasting in our personal righteousness and our works. But is it really being as perfect as God to obey Him and to forsake our sins? Walk worthy of His kingdom? See, faith obeys. First act of faith is obedience to the truth. Mercy remits the past sins, the blood of Christ, no other way, in grace and powers. See, the free gift is remission of past sins. Grace is what empowers you to live a godly life in this present age. What more do you need to truly escape the corruption that's in the world through lust? To constantly fall back into this lust of the flesh, the eyes, and the pride of life that's going to disqualify you from the kingdom, or has already disqualified you from the kingdom, because you never came clean with God to begin with. The Bible speaks of righteousness all the time. I don't know why you fear that word so much. Look at these Proverbs verses here, in Proverbs 11, a couple of verses. The integrity of the upright will guide him, but the perversity of the unfaithful will destroy him. The righteousness of the blameless will direct his ways, but the wicked will fall in his own wickedness. The righteousness of the upright will deliver them, but the unfaithful will be caught by their own lust. 
There it is again. You're supposed to escape the corruption that's in the world through lust. Not gradually, in the process of repentance, or you'll never escape it. That's what the scripture says. The integrity of the upright, the righteousness of the blameless. In Psalms 18, it says, The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands. He has recompensed me. In another verse, a couple of verses later, he says, Therefore the Lord has recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands in his sight. Isn't that exactly what James says? Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Isn't that exactly what it says in the scriptures? And this is exactly what the psalmist done so he can walk uprightly. This would be the most considered the most self-righteous hypocrisy if anything, if someone actually got up on Sunday morning in one of these phony churches and said, the Lord has rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands, because my conscience is pure before God and man. I've been purged and purified by the blood of Christ, and I'm walking uprightly towards him. Oh, get this tar and feather, that man. He's preaching the worst hypocrisy in the world. See, anybody in the Bible that came clean with God like Zacchaeus or the prodigal son or any of the others in the scriptures or Jonah with the Ninevites, well, they were the most self-righteous people in the world. Jesus should have told Zacchaeus, well, Zacchaeus, I was supposed to do those things for you. I was supposed to recompense and, and make reconciliation for all the money you stole and all the people you defrauded. You did too much. But no, he didn't say that. What did he say? He said, today salvation has come to your house. If you want salvation to come to your house and true redemption so you can truly partake of the divine nature and escape the corruption that's in the world through lust, then you're going to have to do so through repentance and come clean with God. You want grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of the Lord, our Savior Jesus Christ, as His divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness? So we have no excuse that through the knowledge of Him, who called us according to glory and virtue, that he has given us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these we may be partakers of the divine nature and escape the corrupt, having escaped, he says, having escaped the corruptions in the world through lust. Already escaped. Just like he said in that, in that later on in chapter 2 in Second Peter, that they escaped those who live in error. Then they fall back then it's worse for them than it was at the beginning, the dog returning to his vomit, the pig to wallow in the mire. That's what's happened to so many. Maybe you were sincere when you came to Christ. I don't know. But I have to question the sincerity of someone that argues in favor of sin all the time. But then again, where are you with God if you keep returning to the mire? You keep falling back into pornography, into perversion, into drunkenness, into all the rest of it in justifying it with 1 John 1, 9. Well, how could John have possibly meant that you can just confess your sin and it's all... He says, he who confesses and forsakes his sin shall find mercy. He who covers his sin shall not prosper, the scripture says. Don't you think John believed that too? That's the reason he's made it clear. By this we know who's of God and who's not. Whoever sins is of the devil. Whoever does what is right is righteous. It couldn't be more clear. But this mess we got outside the system is overwhelming and it continues to boggle my mind that so many people insist upon making a Christ into the minister of sin by preaching this lawless gospel that you commit these sins but you're doing them less. You got pre-forgiveness but you're also accountable. Well, can't you see that God can't forgive you in those vile sins and then turn around and hold you accountable later. It doesn't make sense. They've been preaching that for 500 years and look at the mess we got. That's the great error of the holiness, so-called holiness reformers. At one side of their mouth, you were going to be held accountable for your sin. You had to repent and turn from them. And the other side of your, their mouth, well, you're going to continue to commit them because you're just a hopeless sinner. and You'll be gradually and progressively sanctified. That's why they came up with that mess. Well, then you'll finally be glorified, and then you'll stop sinning. you got justification, sanctification, glorification. That's where that came from, that nonsense. Again, progressively coming out of sins that you should have forsook, 
and stop doing when you repented to begin with. You see how that makes God into a double-minded tyrant. He can't hold you accountable if he's already pre-forgiven you when you came and repeated some words and received Jesus and you, you were still a drunk and a perversion and all the rest of it. It can't, he, it can't happen that way. It turns the gospel on its head. It makes it upside down. That way no one comes out of their sin. And that's what we have on our hands right now. Because so few will grasp the concept of grace and faith and obedience and repentance and all the rest of it. And until you do, then you're going to be trapped under this desperate, saved in sin, sin confess, hoping that you might get in under the wire. But no one in your own conscience, if it's not already seared, with that hot iron of false, false gospel doctrines of demons, that you're not going to make it in. Because where's the assurance in a life like this? The real assurance is what I just said about the divine nature and all things that pertain to life and godliness in the exceedingly great and precious promises of God. If you can receive those and you still can't come clean with God, something's wrong with your gospel. Think it over.